All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining everyone to the Oscope Geochemistry Network's webinar number 12. Uh, so today we'll hear about uh, Victoria State Geoscience Collections uh, and uh, uh, the collaboration we've had, the AGN Oscope uh, with them and getting that collection into the Oz Geochem platform. Let's see. Before we start, I'll just run over a quick uh, update on what we've been doing at the AGN. So we have a busy year coming up, uh, heading to various conferences to present uh, the work we've been doing uh, in the Oz Geochem platform together as the Oscope Geochemistry Network, uh, as well as hosting some sessions and webinars at a number of conferences uh, globally throughout the year. So if you're heading to AEGC in March in Brisbane this year, or uh, Goldschmidt in France, uh, and AESC here in Perth uh, in the middle of the year, or heading out to Thermo 2023 in Italy, 2023 in, in Italy, uh, I think around September towards the, the latter part of the year, um, be sure to check us out Again, we're hosting a lot of sessions, uh, some of them webinars or sorry, workshops, uh, as well as presenting uh, either research that's using Oz Geochem about uh, Oz Geochem uh, platform itself, or again, about uh, the network as a whole. So keep those on your radar and your calendar. I'd love to see you. A uh, quick update on the Oz Geochem platform. We've had some updates come through uh, over the last few months, over uh, the new year here. The Oz Geochem, uh, sorry, the geochemistry model is now live in the Oz Geochem platform. Uh, this includes an uploader, an Excel uploader and export. Uh, and uh, we've been working on uh, a new dashboard to be able to plot the data in a load of different ways that's that's quite editable on which plots you have shown, which ones you want to do, and what you can plot. Um, so get on there, check out the platform if you have any geochemistry data, start playing around. Uh, the other thing that's come in to the platform is DOI minting. So now you can uh, mint your DOIs onto your, your data, which has been really great for uh, some of us that have been uh, working on getting this into the platform uh, for recent papers. We've been trying to get out the door. A lot of uh, journals are trying to get uh, data into repositories, or it's good to have your data uh, with DOIs already beforehand. Uh, so that's live in the platform. And then uh, coming later in the year, but we've been playing around with it in our test environment is the Oz Geochem plate reconstruction tool. Uh, so here in the bottom right of the screen, uh, you can see a little, a little teaser of what we've been going on there. So that's being built, being worked on and uh, is in test. So keep an eye out for that later this year. All right, so now I'll hand off to uh, Oscar, uh, who works at uh, Museums Victoria as the collection manager for the Geo Sciences collection. And he will uh, give you an update about our collaboration and getting that uh, collection into the Oz Geochem platform. Uh, Oscar, I'll have you share the screen. Uh, see if you can just bully me out. If not, I can. Uh... Uh, I think you might need to. To stop sharing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. You see that? Yeah. Excellent. Great. Okay. So thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to AGN for having me. Uh, I'd like to begin before I start giving you this update on the collections and the collaborative project we worked on by acknowledging the uh, Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nations, uh, whose country I live and work on, and uh, extend my respect to First Peoples groups right across Victoria, Australia, and across the world. 
so as Brian said, I'm going to be talking about uh, the state geoscience collections and how a 170 year old collection remains an important resource for 21st century research. So I'm going to begin by showing you something old, and I mean that in two different senses. Uh, on the left here, we've got a piece of the meta conglomerate from Jack Hills. This is the rock that uh, contains the oldest earth materials that have been found thus far, 4.3 billion year old zircon grains. So obviously that's a, a geologically old uh, material. The rock itself is something like 3.6, but uh, so on the right, though, I've got uh, a dravite specimen, dravite tourmaline from Brazil, and uh, this is old, certainly on the scale of uh, Australia uh, as a, on a sort of human scale. So this was a specimen that was purchased in 1857, part of a, a group of about 2,000 specimens. This is a year after the uh, National Museum of Victoria that would go on to be Museums Victoria. Uh, was founded. So give you a bit of a rundown on what I'm going to talk about, give you some background on Victoria State collections, and in particular the geosciences collections, uh, give you some history on the how the collections were assembled, the different components, there's about half of the collections, uh, the result of uh, large transfers from other collection holding institutions. Um, I'll talk about what's in the collections now by the four disciplines that we break them down into uh, and some of the active collection management and uses of the collections. And then I'll go on to talk about digital accessibility and the collaborative project we ran with uh, Oscope last year uh, to get our collection data into OzGeochem and then some final thoughts. Okay, so what are Victoria State Collections? Well, the collections are uh, essentially a collection in, held in public trust. Uh, the, their existence and their scope uh, is defined by legislation, Victorian state legislation, the Museums Act of 1983. And there are something like 17 million specimens and objects in the collections. I'm told that that number may be revised down by a little bit, but you get the idea of the, the order of magnitude of, of what we're talking about here. Uh, so the geosciences collections that I'm responsible for include the mineralogy, petrology, tektites and impactites and meteorites collections. And combined, there's 140,000 or more uh, specimens, 60% of which have been digitally registered and are in our database. They're nearly 170 years old. Uh, founded in 1854, I only stretched it by a couple of years, and we have a global coverage with a particular focus on southeastern Australia and on rare minerals throughout the world. And just to give you an idea of the scope of the entire state collection, this is should just uh, get you thinking about the range of things we we have that you know ranges from uh, historical artifacts. Uh, uh, paleontological material, uh, technology collections, uh, various disciplines of zoological collections, uh, first people's collections, both historical and contemporary. So the value of public geoscience collections uh, really lies in uh, ensuring long-term preservation. So that can be physical and chemical preservation, making sure things don't deteriorate, uh, aren't damaged if they're fragile, uh, findability and facilitating access. So we want to, there's no point having a whole lot of uh, rocks if you can't find the ones you need in order to allow people to use them and uh, preventing dissociation, so loss of information, tying that information to the specimens in terms of where they were found in particular. Uh, <clears throat> so we provide access to rare specimens. So that could be things like rare minerals, gem materials, meteorites, uh, difficult to collect specimens. So material from exhausted mines and mineral deposits, uh, dangerous and restricted areas, particularly for instance, uh, areas that might now be 
reserves and are difficult to collect from now. Uh, the deep sea, places like that. Uh, and of course, the public facing aspects of what we do, the exhibitions and our education programs, making sure that spectacular specimens are available to everyone and fostering a passion for earth sciences. But if I uh, think about the first three, from a research perspective, really what's important there is reproducibility. So when you're doing science, reproducibility is a really important thing. You need to be able to compare like with like if you're trying to uh, validate someone else's uh, results. And so that's really where uh, museum collections fit into that research picture. So a bit of a timeline. So the National Museum of Victoria was the forerunner to Museums Victoria. Uh, the initial nucleus of the state collections was founded in 1854 as a Museum of Economic Geology at the State Assay Office. So even though there's that broad range of uh, types of uh, material we collect, uh, geology was certainly part of uh, those foundational collections. Um, <clears throat> And if I show you the growth of the collection, so this is the mineral collection in particular. Um, you can see this is a cumulative growth and really grew in fits and starts in the first half of the 20th century. It wasn't continuous uh, staffing. And then after 1946, we've had essentially continuous staff in, in mineralogy, geology, and uh, the collections have continued to grow. So I said before that uh, about half of the collections are the result of transfers from other institutions. And so there have been four really large transfers. Uh, and so I sort of think of the collections as five collections that were amalgamated. And the earliest of these was the Industrial and Technological Museum. So Melbourne used to have two, uh, two museum organizations. And these were transferred in 1899 to 1901 and contain a lot of sa samples from significant mineral deposits around the world uh, and material donated by private citizens in the early days of uh, colonial Victoria. Uh, the geological survey collection, so that's around 30,000 specimens was transferred in the 1980s and includes specimens from thousands of historical mines and mineral, mineral occurrences around Victoria and some historically important material like the rocks that uh, resulted from the quarter sheet mapping, the earliest systematic geological mapping of Victoria in the 19th century. Uh, we have the University of Melbourne collection. It's around 30,000 specimens also transferred in the 1980s. Um, and this includes uh, the research collections of staff and students from the 19th century right through to 1989 and some highly significant specimens that I'll show you soon. For instance, uh, pieces of the Murchison meteorite. Uh, and the most recent large transfer was in 2005, the Syro North Ride collection, uh, which was uh, the sort of descendant of the CSIR mineralographic section collection. And so includes a lot of uh, economically important Australian mineral deposits and uh, samples that were worked on by that that group. So just to uh, show you some examples of from each of those major transfers, this is a specimen of gold in a sandstone boulder. If you really squint, you can see the gold little flecks, particularly uh, on the uh, lower left of the larger piece. Um, this was donated by a Mr. F. Cross in 1888. And so this is part of the uh, INT Museum transfer. These are a range of aplite samples, specimens from central Victoria around the Kyneton area, uh, collected as part of the quarter sheet mapping by the Geological Survey. This is one of the pieces of the Murchison meteorite that was transferred as part of the University of Melbourne transfer. This is a really important specimen. Uh, this is probably the most studied meteorite in history. 
uh, was the first uh, that was found to contain organic uh, organic molecules, things like amino acids uh, from space, and was later found to contain pre-solar grains, so little uh, fragments of uh, crystals that uh, predate our solar system. Uh, and this fell in Victoria in 1969, and a whole lot of pieces were picked up by University of Melbourne staff and students within weeks of its fall. And big drawer of uh, ore specimens. Uh, this is an example of the kind of material that's in the, uh, the CSIRO transfer. Okay, so now we'll talk about the contemporary collecting areas of mineralogy, petrology, meteorites, and tektites and impactites. And just give you a bit of a, an overview of uh, the sizes of the collections, what kind of material we've collected, what's particularly significant about those, and show you some examples. So the mineral collection is the largest of the registered components of the, the state collections, geosciences. We've got over 53,000 mineral specimens in the collection, uh, over 2,800 mineral species, so 50% of all known minerals. Um, we have 130 type mineral specimens, and these are specimens that are used to describe new mineral species. And so this is a major uh, research focus of staff in the mineralogy section at Museums Victoria. Uh, and that has resulted in these 130 specimens that uh, sort of serve as the, the benchmark, the global benchmark for what that mineral uh, is. And these are the most intensely, uh, intensively accessed parts of the collections. And Here's a slightly blurry specimen, but uh, we're pushing the limits of what's possible with optical microscopy here. This is uh, tomiolite. It's a mineral described in 2021 by staff at Museums Victoria, uh, Stuart Mills and, and Owen Misson. Uh, and so tomiolite, it's a, an aluminium uh, tellurate sulfate. It was the first tellurate sulfate mineral described. Uh, and it's that's the white needles on this uh, yellow uh, tellurite, tellurium oxide. So the gemstones are an important subcategory of the mineral collection. We've got over ten thousand individual faceted stones, but that drops down to about fifteen hundred uh, registered specimens. Uh, some of those are sort of lots of up to sometimes hundreds of very very small faceted stones. Um, uh, a few highlights, uh, the Pink Jubilee, uh, Australia's largest pink diamond uh, recovered from the Argyle deposit is in the collection. It's an eight carat stone now. It's been partially, uh, partially polished, faceted out of a, a 12 carat uh, stone, rough stone that was found. Uh, around half of the gemstone collection came to us as one donation. Uh, what's, from uh, Ron Hurwitz, and so that's a significant part of the gemstone collection. Uh, I'll show you a specimen from the Hurwitz collection. This is probably the highlight, a uh, really beautiful pigeon blood ruby uh, from Cambodia, uh, 3.8 carats, so really quite a large stone about the size of a fingernail. So the petrology collection, so the rocks and ores, we've got 16,000 specimens. Most of the unregistered material will end up in the petrology collection. Uh, we've got a very thorough coverage of Victoria and southeastern Australia, particularly historical Victorian mines and mineral occurrences. Um, and uh, that's particularly through material that was transferred from the, the geological survey. And I'm jumping ahead here, showing you a screenshot from Ausgeochem, but I thought this was just a nice, uh, nice little thing to show you. Uh, that map with the uh, the red circles around the localities of pumice specimens uh, that were the result of a 2017 uh, uh, marine voyage uh, undertaken by researchers at the uh, museum here and as well as collecting uh, faunal samples, which was their primary 
reason for going out there. They also collected rocks for us. And so this is a really uh, interesting and hard to recollect group of specimens. So tectites and impactites. Uh, we've got probably one of the world's largest collections of tectites and particularly well represented are australites, so Australian tectites from the Port Campbell area, which is one of the best places in the world to find uh, really nicely formed tectites. Uh, the majority of the tectite collection uh, came from two collectors, George Baker and Ralph Euler. Ralph is uh, still alive. Uh, George Baker did most of his collecting in the sort of up until the 1940s, I think. Um, and Ralph Euler is a meticulous uh, amateur scientist who uh, collected a lot of uh, sort of thousands of tectites over many years and was really good about uh, recording precise information about how they were found, uh, exactly where they were found. And so this is a really uh, unique resource. Uh, we also have non-Port Campbell uh, tectites from all over the Australasian strewn field. Uh, nice example we got uh, last year were some uh, Philippine tectites, Philippinites from uh, donated by Mark Bayer Begatzing, who was the grandson of uh, Henry Otley Bayer, who was the first uh, person to describe the Philippine tectites. And here's just a few uh, Euler collection tectites from Port Campbell showing the variety of shapes. The one on the top left is really interesting. It's, it's actually hollow. We've got a couple of hollow tectites in the collection. So the meteorite collection, we have about 500 meteorite specimens, including 14 Victorian meteorites. Uh, the Murchison meteorite that I already talked about is quite significant, uh, as well as a number of large pieces of the Cranburn meteorites that were the largest known meteorites at the time they were found in the mid 19th century. Uh, the largest of these is that we have is Cranburn number two, which is 1.5 tons. Uh, difficult specimen to move. Uh, an important contribution towards the meteorites, about a third of the collection came from uh, Professor John Lovering's uh, research collection of meteorites donated in 2013. And we have pieces of uh, meteorites that have come from the moon and Mars, which are also quite significant. So this is a specimen from the Lovering collection. It's the Ben Cubbon meteorite. It's quite an unusual uh, kind of meteorite. It's classified as a carbonaceous chondrite uh, because it has, you can see the sort of dark patches, uh, bits of carbonaceous chondrite, but it also has uh, a lot of uh, iron nickel metal. And so it's, you know, you don't often find these two uh, components in the same meteorite. Okay, so that ends with my overview of the collections. Uh, I'll now talk a little bit about uh, some of the ongoing collection management activities that uh, I do in looking after the collections before I move on to uh, how the collections are used and the Osgeochem project. So uh, really the four very broad uh, categories of work that we do to manage the collection. Um, acquisition of significant uh, specimens for the collections, new acquisitions, uh, digitizing the existing collections and information sources, preserving and organizing the collections and facilitating access for a variety of purposes. So just a few examples of recent acquisitions. Uh, on the left here, so a whole lot of uh, sapphires, a few different colors, but there's a really nice yellow sapphire there from Cardinia Creek. Uh, this is an area that is now underneath the part of the uh, Cardinia Reservoir, east of Melbourne. And these are specimens that were collected and donated by Ian Ton, uh, who was just a member of the public who approached us, collected them when he was, uh, I think, around nine, he used to go fossicking in the creek. And uh, this is an area that's no longer accessible. So really interesting and uh, hard to replace uh, specimens. Uh, the one in the middle here is this really interesting looking mushroom albar uh, tourmaline from Mogok in Burma, Myanmar. Um, and it was donated uh, last year by Dr. Bill Birch, who's our 
uh, curator emeritus in the mineralogy section. And on the right here is a wolfenite specimen, quite a nice one, from San Francisco mine in Mexico. And that was part of a, a donation of uh, a whole range of mostly uh, North American, uh, as well as some Southeast Asian material, uh, sort of nice small display specimens donated by Ian Strawn last year as well. So digitization is a large part of what I do. Uh, collection registration is part of that. We've had 17,000 specimens registered over the last decade. Uh, digitizing analog information sources. So a lot of the historical collections, we have good information about them, things like localities, but uh, these are in uh, you know, old registers from the, some of which date back to the 19th century that we got from say the University of Melbourne or the Geological Survey. And we've been working to get all of those digitized in order to make them, uh, I guess, secure, prevent information loss and easier to use for uh, digitizing those parts of the collections. Uh, there was a project I worked on a couple of years ago, uh, Digivol, if you haven't heard of it uh, and you're really keen on uh, helping out uh, collection holding institutions, go and have a look. You can transcribe labels uh, as a sort of citizen science project. Um, and uh, data enhancement of you know, existing uh, registered specimens. So that could be drawing on archival material, collecting new al analytical data, uh, image capture, things like that. And you can see there the, uh, the database looming over the uh, old 19th century register. Uh, so preservation is an important part of what we do. Uh, controlling and monitoring the temperature and humidity in the collection store is a, an ongoing work that we do to make sure that it's suitable for long-term preservation of minerals. Uh, some rocks and minerals need particular care, things like uh, sulfide minerals, uh, iron meteorites. They get put into individual low oxygen dehydrating uh, or impermeable enclosures. Uh, we also use similar kinds of enclosures for things like uh, mercury minerals because they uh, degas mercury, off-gas mercury. And um, that's to for our safety while working with them, but also to prevent that mercury vapor from then interacting with uh, other specimens in the same cabinets. Uh, hazard mitigation and flagging. Naturally, we have heavy metals, radioactive materials, asbestos, because we're trying to collect the full range of, uh, of uh, rocks and minerals that occur in nature. So, uh, and location tracking. So the museum uses a, a digital location tracking system where every specimen can be given a barcode and every uh, location can be given a barcode. And so far over 80,000 geological specimens have been given those barcodes and location tracked. So that information's all available to us. So we can uh, find specimens when we want to. And here's a drawer full of iron meteorites that are in their low oxygen enclosures. You can see on the specimen on the front, uh, front right there, some of the oxygen scavengers that are in the bag uh, with the meteorite. Okay, so now on to how the collections are used. So a large part of how the collections are used uh, is for external research. So we get approached by researchers and I you know, facilitate the uh, loan of specimens or subsampling of specimens uh, for research projects. Um, a few highlights of external research in recent years. Um, is this really interesting uh, project that was done looking at uh, biominerals, and I'll show you some more detail on that Santa Barbarite biomineral uh, project in a, in a second, but we've also had uh, Grandviewite as a mineral was redefined uh, thanks to specimens in our collection, um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy of molybdenum minerals, uh, infrared reflectance of clinozoocyte and chemontite, 
uh, by CSIRO. So a range of different projects in, in uh, quite different areas across you know, economic geology, material science, uh, sort of pure and applied mineralogy, uh, geological research, things like that. So this is the, uh, the Santa Barbara biomineral, uh, and it got a lot of press. Um, I think mostly thanks to the name of the animal that was found to, uh, to produce this biomineral. Uh, so the gumboot chitin, also known as the wandering meatloaf. So, of course, we do our own research. Uh, that's not how you spell collections, but um, uh, on a range of topics, uh, including, uh, like I said before, describing new minerals, uh, the geology of unusual uh, mineral assemblages, uh, some museology, uh, and historical uh, use of the collections for historical research. <clears throat> so as well as research, uh, exhibitions and education are an important part of what we do. The Dynamic Earth Gallery at Melbourne Museum is the centerpiece of the geosciences exhibition activities we do. Um, we've also, we loan specimens out for exhibition and displays elsewhere. Museum of Chinese Australian History, Central Deborah Tourist Mine in Bendigo, University of Melbourne and CSIRO all have our specimens currently on displays. Um, and we also, uh, within the geosciences section, have postgraduate student supervision. We have interns sometimes. Uh, we run a short course and do a whole range of uh, teaching activities. And so here's a one of the cases in the Dynamic Earth Gallery uh, showing, this is a, highlighting the color gradient in, in some minerals. Okay, so now onto digital accessibility and uh, the OzGeochem project. So uh, what is digital accessibility? Well, really we wanna make our collection data searchable by researchers, other institutions, members of the public. Um, we have a, an in-house uh, online portal called Collections Online that for a long time has shared data for geological specimens, but it's not specific to geological data. It includes something like 1.3 million records across all of those broad disciplines that I uh, ran through at the beginning of the presentation. So um, it's also not spatially searchable or viewable. So there are certainly uh, advantages we thought to the OzGeochem uh, platform for geological data. Uh, other collecting areas uh, already contributed data to national and international aggregators. Uh, in particular, the Atlas of Living Australia uh, aggregates uh, zoological data uh, and botany as well, I believe. And this is just a snapshot of uh, the range of the uh, platypus on the Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, and so this, uh, the way the uh, export of our data to the Atlas of Living Australia works was uh, laid a lot of the groundwork for what we did with uh, OzGeochem. Okay, so a bit of a timeline of the collaboration. Uh, discussions began after a presentation by Sam Boone actually uh, at AESC 2021. Uh, this was before OzGeochem had launched, and uh, the discussions we had between the museum and uh, OzScope were centered around how could we use OzGeochem to aggregate data relating to specimens available for research rather than just analytical data that was already collected. Uh, a memorandum of understanding was signed between Museums Victoria and OzScope in June last year. Uh, the project aligns with our priority initiative to develop digital initiatives that enable research access to Museums Victoria's collections. Should be fairly obvious why that uh, initiative is aligned with this project. Um, and following this, we spent six months workshopping a data model, mapping data from our EMU collection database, the name of our database. Um, 
<clears throat> automating the export process and then testing and revising the final output. And in December last year, our two data packages for mineralogy and petrology were launched. And this is what the data looks like on a map. And this was quite an exciting thing to see. Uh, really it shows the global coverage we have. Um, and, you know, it's just a really intuitive way to uh, browse the data. And, um, you know, every point on this map, for those who aren't familiar with OzGeochem, uh, is a specimen in the collection. This is just showing our data. Uh, and you can click on them and get, get more information. So we did run into some difficulties during this process um, and had to come up with solutions to them. Uh, so to start with, uh, the minimum data requirements we agreed were that a specimen had to have spatial coordinates and a valid rock or mineral name. Now this immediately ruled out uh, around a third of uh, registered specimens because they don't have spatial coordinates. Um, matching the material type, essentially the rock or mineral name, was uh, fairly complex uh, because we didn't always use the same names, particularly for rocks. Uh, there were some issues with mineral groups. For instance, uh, uh, Phillipsite uh, was a you know, name under which we had a lot of minerals categorized, uh, the OzGeochem name had to be either philipsite potassium, philipsite calcium, so on as uh, valid mineral names. And so we couldn't just by looking at the database uh, determine which it was. So we had to make a decision that in cases like that, we would essentially go up a level, uh, lose some of the fine detail, but get the data in. Um, we resolved a lot of these issues by having an intermediary table where we essentially said, if this is the name in our database, this is what it should be uh, in the export. Uh, but there was some loss of detailed information through that. Uh, there are challenges with working with a historical data set uh, that, you know, I guess was not the mindset that the OzGeochem, OSCO, Lithodat teams were in. Um, a lot of the time, descriptive localities are the primary spatial information uh, in our specimens, and you can assign coordinates based on sometimes quite detailed uh, descriptive localities, but um, uh, we really wanted to make sure that kind of information was was shared because, you know, we could be wrong in our interpretation of what that uh, descriptive locality means and, and the primary data should be uh, available to people who are using the collections. And so a solution that was uh, a sort of uh, landed on partway through was this idea of properties. So there are user specific data types that can be added. Uh, and so for instance, we have uh, uh, created properties for um, georeference details. So how was that georeference uh, determined? Uh, some geological details when we had kinds of information that didn't fit neatly into the OzGeochem fields and uh, a descriptive locality property. And here's another screenshot from OzGeochem, just showing you the kinds of information, the lower half of the uh, detailed information on the right uh, from descriptive locality down are all properties. And you can see this is quite a detailed locality, uh, Friars Town, Cattles Reef, 135 feet deep, reef 20 to 30 feet wide, etc. Um, so, you know, that's quite a good locality if you're if you want to spend the time to figure out where that is, uh, but it's not necessarily a, a, an easily uh, convertible into coordinates locality. So we automated our export process, and this is a benefit of having in-house programming. Uh, it's probably a good moment to thank Michael Mason. I'm not sure if he's uh, watching, but uh, Michael is a, did all of the programming work um, and was able to take the you know, ideas we set in words and turn them into, into programming. So, um, uh, so essentially, uh, 
the way the automated export works is it selectively draws data from the EMU collection database based on uh, flags that we put into the database telling, uh, saying that we want to export this data to OzGeochem. Uh, it then does some processing and creates records directly on OzGeochem via the platform's API. If anyone is interested, the code is freely available online by Museums Victoria's GitHub. I'll post the link after the presentation if this is something you're interested in looking at. Uh, and so from now on, there'll be monthly updates as we continually update with new records, corrections, additional data, and occasionally if we want to remove a record. So what you're seeing here is another uh, really great uh, customization that the uh, Oscope Lithodat teams were able to put together. Uh, we have a lot of images in our database and so they were able to uh, build the infrastructure for us to export images, uh, also putting in a filter. Uh, and you can see this really nice uh, Vivianite specimen uh, with images here. So the outcomes of this initial project were that we exported over 43,000 specimen records onto OzGeochem. Uh, over 1,000 images of specimens were also exported, and we expect this to grow over time. Um, so, and then of course, the collection data can now be viewed and searched using the OzGeochem's uh, purpose built tools for geological samples, and it's accessible to anyone. So, a few final thoughts. Uh, so, Victoria State Geoscience Collections are really valuable and irreplaceable. Um, and I think it's useful to think about them as research infrastructure because they really can contribute to research just as much as a piece of analy analytical equipment or lab space can. Uh, time, energy, and resources and expertise are needed to maintain the collections uh, in a usable state and facilitate access. Um, Sharing our data with OzGeochem is a significant step towards making the collections digitally accessible. And I think a, an important uh, change that this allows is that questions can be driven, research questions can be driven by what's available rather than the sort of existing model is that someone would come to us with a research question and say, do you have uh, specimens that can help us work on this problem? And I think if uh, researchers are able to just browse the data. Uh, there might be questions that they wouldn't have thought of otherwise that they'd like to ask and then can then come to us. Uh, and uh, Museums Victoria is the first large collection holding institution to share our data on OzGeochem, but there are many others, lots of the state museums, uh, as well as the um, national collections in Canberra. Um, there's also a lot of the surveys have collections and universities, of course. So I think it would be great to see uh, a lot of other collections uh, end up on OzGeochem. I think there'd be real value to being able to work with the data side by side on the same platform. Although of course, this is up to individual institutions to uh, make decisions about. So finally, I showed you something old at the beginning. So here's something new. Uh, so I showed you one of the oldest specimens to be to enter the collection. And on the left here is this Spangolite specimen. That's in fact, one of the most recent. It was just registered last week. Spangolite's a, a copper aluminium sulfate mineral, uh, quite a rare mineral. And uh, I showed you the uh, meta conglomerate with the 4.3 billion year old zircons. Well, quite a lot younger than, than uh, those zircons is this basaltic glass that we can actually date to the 3rd of May, 2019, because that's when it erupted. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Oscar. Yeah, if anybody has questions, just uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Thank you. 
Hi, Bryant. Uh, nobody else was jumping in, so I thought I would. Uh, this is Matthias from the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, I'm actually a librarian by background, so I'm very excited to see more cultural collections. Well, sorry, museum collections uh, made discoverable through portals like OzGeoChem. Uh, I was wondering, and in fact, I made a comment about it in the chat. Uh, I possibly missed this in your presentation. Have you considered or will you be minting IGSNs for your samples? Uh, so I can probably take this one. Um, so uh, at this stage, we have specifically requested IGSNs aren't minted, um, where you know, for 170 years have been in the business of already having unique identifiers. And uh, it, it may or may not be something we go, uh, a path we go down uh, in the long run. But yeah, for now, uh, uh, I believe uh, Oz Geochem does or can mint IGSMs. Um, Brian might want to talk about that. But uh, yeah, we, we specifically uh, decided not to go down that path. Um, hey Oscar, it's Alexander Prent here from uh, yeah, from the Netherlands. Um, I've got a question. Um, the Osgeochem platform allows for geochemical uploads, right? And I know that you guys have a bit of uh, electron probe and other analytical data with your samples. Have you tried uploading that data with the samples also already? Yeah, so it's a it's a good question. Um, uh, I think the we haven't tried uploading any chemical data at this stage, but I think it is something that would be good to do if we can. There are issues around uh, if we wanted to make it part of the automated export, that might be tricky. We'd have to make sure everything was formatted the same. Uh, our database doesn't actually host uh, chemical data where we have it. It's typically uh, attached into the database as whatever format it was provided to us in spreadsheets or CSVs or, or PDFs even. Um, so there's that. I, I guess another issue we could potentially face is um, uh, a lot of the data we have, chemical data, has been acquired by other people, and we need to be very careful about uh, sharing data collected often at, at expense by other people. Um, perhaps, you know, there's some time limit but uh yeah so i think um we do have a lot of internally collected data though and uh, if we can get it in the the you know a format that works uh, i think it would be a really interesting and useful thing to do yeah and i think to stress here that that the development of of the emu connection via the api is really uh um, a massive step in in automating these, uh, making these these collections accessible and um, available to the public. And if that that then has it has some underpinning in a standardized form, templates of geochemical data that then connect, because I understand there's a lot of different types of um, data formatting available in your stores with respect to the geochemistry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it's interesting also, um, uh, a lot of the large collections around the country and overseas use the same EMU database. And so uh, I know the Australian Museum does and uh, the national collections at Geoscience Australia do. So I think there's potential for uh, if those organisations were interested in doing something similar, um, there wouldn't be a lot of uh, tweaking needed to our code. Yeah, cool. And to step in on that briefly too, I think that's yeah, it's really good to to stress that uh, you know if they use the same system or a lot of this work has kind of been been done now, uh, groundwork at least, and and going back to adding geochem or anything. I think what's really great is uh, understanding and stressing that this isn't also a static like snapshot is as you brought up in your your presentation it'll be updated uh, you know at, at regular intervals and then potentially 
uh, marred things like geochem data can be added in and everything. And I think that that's what's really powerful about something like this is it's not just now we have a, a static screenshot of what your collection looks like in December 2022. Uh, it will constantly be updating as, as you get more specimens, get more data, get more images, because those are definitely really cool. Oscar, uh, Barry Conn here. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. I think this really adds a new dimension to the AGN in terms of the more traditional sources that have been uh, input so far. Where, where there are publications related to particular specimens, are they somehow linked to the information and, you know, maybe PDFs or something of the relevant papers with that sort of chemical or petrological information? Is that is that something you've done or thinking of doing? Uh, so uh, a lot of the time we do have that kind of information uh, recorded in our database, not always because, you know, when people have worked on our specimens, uh, it's really a lot of uh, time and effort to to chase up. Uh, you know, it's one thing even just to get the data back, but then to get people to uh, provide papers that have used our specimens uh, can be a challenge. But um, it's not something that we currently have done with um, uh, through Oz Geochem. I guess the the link that's there is anyone who uses our specimens is required to use our uh, registration numbers, and so on Oz Geochem you can just search based on registration number. So if you come across in a paper, um, uh, you know that they used a certain specimen. Yeah. And it's on Osgeo, can you'll be able to find it, but that other direction link isn't yeah. there at the moment. Okay, yeah, there's just a sort of another dimension yeah. of information, possibly, which, yeah, certainly, yeah, okay. Anyway, thanks for very, very interesting. Sorry, Alex here again. One more question that. Um, I think of is there links in the Osgeochem uh, sample data that refers to your own uh, search and and data uh, platform? Because you were saying that there was also a functionality on the Museums Victoria page where you can search for uh, minerals or and if if there's links from that platform to the Osgeochem and vice versa, that'd be really nice, I think, then you can access all additional information. Uh, or does that work like that? So I'm not quite sure I I follow. Um, so at the moment, I guess it, although it's a, um, you know, a, an automated monthly export, once the export has happened, uh, that data is is essentially static for that month. And so there's not a continual back and forth link uh, like it sounds like you might be uh, imagining. I'm not sure. Uh, I was thinking if there's a URI in, um, included in the export to Osteochem, that then if you were to search for that additional uh, data, you say there's a little bit of um, data loss in the transfer. The granularity and yeah. i thought that there's a victoria museums victoria page that you can use to search if... yeah so so that's that's a good point um uh so the we've managed to overcome that problem through the use of these properties so for instance uh the kinds of data loss that i was talking about are you know we might have called a called a rock specimen um you know a store a light garnet nice or something. And uh, that term wasn't in the uh, Oz Geochem vocabulary. And so we've just called it a, a nice or something like that. But we've still, we're still uh, exporting that original name as a property as well. So I think we've, we've called that something like uh, extended rock name or something like that. But yeah, so that information is still going out there. Um, uh, there, I don't think there is any information that is on our collections online page that isn't also being exported to Osgeochem. In fact, there's some some additional information, uh, but certainly, um, I guess, I mean, I've been using uh, 
using OzGeochem a lot to to do searching and then you know just exporting a, a list of numbers and then plugging them back into our database even uh, if I want to do a, a spatial search or something like that. Um, so yep. yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely uh, across how it all works, but I thought mm -hmm. if you include one link in one page and include it in another web page, that then becomes more popular for Google. So I was thinking that then becomes more accessible and, and more findable, you know, if there's if there's multiple links to the same data source or the same. So that, that's something I was thinking of. Yeah, okay. But just a thought. Something worth, worth looking into. <laughs> Uh, uh, jump in if I can, and more, probably more so a question for Brian. Um, so yeah, Cameron Cairns, Geological Survey Victoria. Has it been, and maybe it's already up there, maybe I haven't looked deep enough, but data metallogenica that, that Amara were funding for a while, that, that seemed to be struggling, and I think it's in South Australia, the physical collection. Is there any talk about potentially bringing that into the fold? Uh, uh, that's Good question. We've had talks before, and uh, just off the top of my mind, it does ring a bell with Amira, uh, but uh, nothing, nothing at this stage yet. I know that there's been um, inquiries uh, reached uh, out. Fabian, yeah, yeah, Brian, maybe if I can jump in here, so yeah, yeah, definitely. Fabian here from from Lizardot. Um, we have been in touch with with Amira um, together with with Brent McGuinness from from AGN, and I have been even at this. Um, they had a workshop in Southern Australia, um, Amira about this workshop um, about that collection, and I have been there. And we have been talking, and there are ongoing talks because they are trying to to set up a new system how they make all their collections and all Amira data um, digital available. And um, yeah, the, they are very interested as well in potentially using OsteoChem to make that data that, but it's still, it, it's ongoing talks. Thanks. And I, I suppose along similar lines, um, it's, a, it's a bit dire to say, and the reason I ask about that is that like a lot of the trade uni data, I believe went to, went there. And unfortunately we're facing, obviously in Australia, a lot of universities and earth science are um, not living on. I mean, is this something that um, you know, sort of Oscar touched on it before about possibly um, uh, some of these collections from, I mean, Fed Uni and Ballarat probably not offering geology anymore, and Macquarie and, and the like is trying to get those collections into um, AGN. Yeah, yeah, and this is this is exactly something that we've been uh, thinking a lot about and targeting with Osteochem. Uh, so. Uh, that's, uh, I guess, fueled this collaboration with uh, Museums Victoria uh, and hoping to be extended out, uh, as well as, uh, let's say, saving legacy collections. So finding, finding this exact kind of thing happen either, either through uh, what you've just said or just simply people retiring and, uh, and uh, that data being on thumb drives and, and drawers kind of kinds of things or, or stacked in a corner uh, in boxes. Uh, so these are all things we've, we've worked on in the early days, uh, saving some of the shrimp collection here at, at Curtin. Uh, there's been a lot of work with, with the, um, the thermochronology collection in, in Melbourne and getting that into the, the platform. So these are all things that that we are targeting and working on, and and uh, a lot of them are in early stages, as Fabian just said. With with talking, we're still a relatively young platform. With it being live, it went up in October, late October, twenty twenty one, and this uh, collaboration we've had with Museums Victoria has been really great for displaying the potential and and working out a lot of those kinks of. Uh, and wrinkles that we have to get through on on bringing in different different uh, types of data collection. So young, but done so much. Well done. <laughs> yeah, have a lot of great team. It'd be fantastic to have that Amira collection at least cross referenced in our system. It, it is quite extraordinary and and probably unique in the world with its focus on ore deposits on the complete, you know, complete su suites of specimens from major ore deposits, which of course 
tend to be transient. They don't tend to, you know, especially if it's an important ore deposit, they tend to end up as a big hole in the ground. So it's it's something we really need to work hard at, I think. Great. Well, thanks everyone. I realize it's getting quite late over there in the east. Uh, so unless there's any more pressing questions, I'll say thanks to Oscar for presenting. Thanks to everybody for joining. And uh, definitely if you have any questions related to AGN, reach out to our team. Uh, if you have any questions on the uh, Museum's Victoria Collection, uh, I'm sure Oscar will happily field any of that. And uh, yeah, uh, keep an eye out for our next AGN uh, webinar coming up um, roughly six weeks or so. Uh, also, this one will, will go online uh, to be viewed later. So thanks again, Oscar and everyone for joining. Have a good rest of your day and week. <laughs>